what happens when a young, curious person who's majoring in mathematics is challenged by a mystery? We're going to find out today from Lucas Mason Brown, who is a senior math major at Brown University. Um, we talked electronically, um, but that, uh, we were just talking a moment ago, Lucas knew very little about our namesake at the university until he found in the John Carter Brown Library Collection a book, and you know this, good friends from the Family Association, about the book that contained a number of mysterious uh, annotations. And for decades, shall we say centuries, no scholar knew for sure what those ciphers were about. And of course, uh, in this modern age, all you have to do is issue a challenge to someone who is inquisitive and a little bit skilled and challenged in uh, research. And Lucas, I, I don't want to omit anyone else, and your colleagues uh, were up to the challenge. And you're going to tell us much more about that uh, activity and the outcome. And I don't want to take more of my time except to welcome and to thank you for being here today. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out this afternoon. It's on. My name is Lucas Mason Brown. I'm a senior at Brown University concentrating in mathematics and the philosophy of science. Um, as some of you may know, Brown is home to an extremely rare 17th century book, subtitled An Essay Towards the Reconciling of Differences Among Christians. Um, there's a picture of that book right here. The margins of this book are, are filled with roughly 250 pages worth of cryptic shorthand writing, long believed to be the work of, of Roger Williams, the famous 17th century theologian, founder of Rhode Island, and of course the namesake of this university. Um, for about a year now, I've been involved in a broad, collaborative effort to decipher this shorthand and translate its contents into English. Um, and so far, we've made quite a bit of progress, which I'd like to share with you all today. But first, I want to, um, I want to recognize some of the people I've had the pleasure of working with over the past year or so. Um, historians Ted Widmer, Stephen Lubar, J. Stanley Lemons, a fantastic local William Scholar, Linford Fisher, with whom I'm currently collaborating on an article, Hal Cook, Tim Harris, <coughs> and Francis Henderson, all the way over at Oxford. In addition, Jeff Hofstein, the chairman of the math department at Brown, and Eugene Charniak, a renowned computational linguist. I want to start today by stating a few preliminary facts about the book itself. As I mentioned, the book is subtitled An Essay Towards the Reconciling of Differences Among Christians. Its title page was either never printed or alternatively printed and subsequently lost or destroyed. As a result, the author, title, and year of publication are all unknown. The book is 234 pages long, including preface and flyleaf, and virtually every square inch of every margin of every page is filled with this writing. I'll show you pictures in a minute. Um, the book was donated to the Brown family in 1817, together with a handwritten note identifying Williams as the likely author of the marginal writing. Um, the book then entered the official collections of the John Carter Brown Library about a decade later when it was formally established, um, which is where the book remains today. Here's a copy of that handwritten note and my attempt at a translation on the left. The crucial paragraph over here seems to read, the margin is filled with shorthand, 1616 by Roger Williams. Although the date is probably nonsense, um, we do have good reasons to believe that Roger Williams was, in fact, the man behind the shorthand. And I'll explain some of these reasons to you in a little bit. This is what a typical page in the book looks like. Um, notice the printed text in the middle um, and the, the marginal notes, left, right, top, and bottom. Here's that same image, here's that same image blown up let you look at that for a second. Um, notice also the, uh, the marginalia appears to be divided by horizontal lines here and here into short paragraphs or stanzas. This is a format which persists throughout the book. Okay. 
So I want to spend most of my time today describing some of the important structural features of the, of the so-called Roger Williams cipher. Um, towards the end of my presentation, I'll touch upon some of the historical discoveries we've made, but I should mention that I'm not an historian in any capacity, and on many of these things, my analysis is just as informed as yours. Anyway, the code is based very loosely on a popular 17th century shorthand system um, developed by a man named John Willis in 1602, incidentally one year before Roger Williams was born. Um, it should come as no surprise that Williams was acquainted with the system given that he apprenticed for many years as a court stenographer for Sir Edward Cook, a prominent London jurist and lawyer. Um, the code consists of 28 core characters, each representing a distinct English letter or sound. Here are those 28 core characters and their English correlates to the left. Notice that C has no corresponding cipher character. C defaults to either K or S, depending on, depending on usage. This is also contained in the handout that I think I've given most of you. So that's what the code basically consists of. How does it operate? Well, on consonants, it operates like any ordinary substitution cipher, which is to say a consonant is encoded by substituting in the corresponding cipher character, um, very straightforwardly. As a sidebar, the first consonant of a word is typically much larger than the rest. This is, I think, for the sake of readability. However, vowels are encoded in a very different way. In fact, three different ways, depending on where precisely in the word the vowel appears. A vowel which appears at the beginning of a word is encoded in the ordinary way, much like a consonant, by substituting in the corresponding shorthand character. Um, however, a vowel which appears in the middle of a word is encoded implicitly via the, the physical relationship between the enclosing consonants. The precise nature of this physical relationship is dictated by what I've been calling the clock mechanism. Um, in this system, consonants within a word are organized into miniature clusters, kind of like planets around a sun, with different spatial arrangements corresponding to different vowel sounds. So for example, to spell the word bat, we start with a shorthand character corresponding to B, what looks like a horseshoe kind of, um, followed by a much smaller shorthand T in the A position of that B. Um, as you can probably guess, to spell the word bet or B, we simply shift the T up slightly into the E position. To spell the word bit or bite, we place it in the I position. Boat or boot in the O position. But or but in the U position. And similarly for other combinations of consonants. Here's an example of the clock mechanism at work um, in the text itself. Here Roger Williams encodes the word wars with a shorthand W what looks like a right parenthesis, kind of, followed by a shorthand R, a horizontal line, placed in the A position of that W. The word is then made plural by attaching a shorthand S to the end of the R. Finally, a vowel which appears at the end of a word is encoded as a dot. Um, the position of the dot is once again dictated by the clock mechanism. So to encode the word no, we place a dot in the O position of the shorthand N. To encode the word saw, we place a dot in the A position of the shorthand S. Notice that in the second instance, the W is not explicitly encoded. This is, as I think I mentioned, a largely phonetic shorthand system. So up to this point, we've only been discussing monosyllabic words, words of one syllable. <coughs> As you can probably imagine, things get much more complicated as additional syllables are added. Um, <coughs> polysyllabic words are encoded much like monosyllabic words as character clusters. These clusters are organized around the first uh, letter of the word. The major issue is that many polysyllabic words emit multiple valid encodings. And conversely, many character clusters correspond to multiple polysyllabic words. Um, the two clusters on the bottom of this slide represent two equally valid encodings of the English word butter. In the figure on the left, the shorthand R is placed in the E position of the shorthand B. You can consult the, um, the diagram on the handout. Whereas in the figure on the right, the shorthand R is placed in the E position of the shorthand T, producing a kind of 
nested effect. Um, if things weren't confusing enough, either of these clusters represent, or might represent in different circumstances, valid encodings of the English words better or Beirut. So you have to be very careful when translating polysyllabic words. Defectives or marked omissions are another major challenge. Um, typically, when encoding po long polysyllabic words, we, admit, we, we omit all but the most important characters. Um, these omissions are usually marked either with a, with a dot or a specially placed character and are often referred to as defectives in the parlance of 17th century shorthand stenography. Um, it's hard for me to overemphasize the crucial role that defectives play in the Roger Williams cipher. You can, you can identify entire page-long stretches of shorthand where Roger, Roger Williams relies on nothing but defectives to communicate his ideas. So in many ways, developing a, a sophisticated understanding of defectives and how Williams uses them is the key to translating large portions of shorthand. Here's a defective from the text that I think illustrates some of the attending difficulties. Here the word desire is encoded by placing a shorthand R in what appears to be the O position of a shorthand T. Um, in this case, the E, S, and I are taken as implicit. Um, of course, the major issue is that this might, in a different context, represent the word deride, or derision, or deflower, or detour. So, with defectives, as with many other elements of the Roger Williams cipher, context is absolutely the key. Two last sort of idiosyncrasies I want to discuss with you today. Um, these are special abbreviations and pictographs. Many of the, many of the 28 core symbols double as arbitrary stand-ins for, for common words and phrases. Um, some of these abbreviations are, are logical. For example, the shorthand O is often used to represent the English word of, for obvious reasons. Some of these are much less logical. So, for whatever reason, Roger Williams has chosen the shorthand P to represent the, the article the. I have no idea why. Um, and in addition to the 28 core symbols, Roger Williams frequently relies on cartoons and pictographs and sometimes punt more elaborate puns to communicate complicated ideas. One of my favorite pictographs is uh, displayed on the bottom of this slide. Maybe, maybe you guys can try to guess what this means. Any ideas? It's a little tricky. So this is the English word friendship. It consists of a, of a longhand F followed by a crude drawing of a ship. Um, this is what linguists call a rebus, where a, a picture or a crude glyph is used to represent a particular part of a word. And things like this appear throughout the text. So despite all of these challenges, we've accomplished quite a bit in the past year or so, specifically three things. Um, <coughs> First of all, using documents afforded to us by the Rhode Island Historical Society, we've been able to conclusively confirm Roger Williams' authorship of the marginal notes. Second, and maybe most importantly, we've translated nearly 200 pages of, of encoded material, about 20 to 30 pages of which constitute original, unpublished commentary on several hot-button theological issues. Um, and finally, using evidence gleaned from the translated material, we've been able to, to date William's authorship of the notes to the, to the last four years of his life, 1679 to 1683, making these documents among his final written works. Let me now elaborate on each of these accomplishments. Um, so about maybe eight or nine months ago, we obtained access to a collection of Roger William's personal correspondences. One of these letters in particular contains several lines of shorthand on the bottom. Um, this shorthand matches the shorthand found in our book in a number of, of crucial and conclusive respects. Um, interestingly, and I won't say too much more about this, our shorthand also matches the shorthand found in the margins and the cover leaf of William's personal edition of the so-called Elliot Indian Bible. Um, some of you may know the Elliot Indian Bible was the first Bible published in the Western Hemisphere. It was a translation of, I think, the Geneva Bible into the Massachusetts dialect of Algonquin, prepared by John Eliot, a sort of prominent Massachusetts Bay Puritan, with the intention of converting local Indians to Christianity. 
Um, in this and also in one of the documents we deciphered is evidence of a very fascinating, sometimes mysterious connection between Williams and Eliot, two of the most prominent New England Puritans, which is also the topic of, a, of an essay I'm currently working on with Professor Binford Fisher. So if you're interested, keep your eyes peeled. The, the 200 some pages of notes we deciphered are divided into three sections. The first and third sections are relatively uninteresting. They consist of Roger Williams' notes on pre-existing published texts. Um, the first section, which is by far the longest, about 165 pages of marginalia, consists of Roger Williams' almost verbatim notes on a popular 17th century cosmography, um, a book called Cosmography in Four, in Four Parts by a man named Peter Haley. Um, the third section, about 30 pages, consists of Roger, Roger Williams' notes on a popular 17th century anatomy <coughs> text called Bartholinus Anatomy. Um, interestingly, but not very importantly, this anatomy text um, and Roger Williams' notes on it exhibit a particular emphasis on sex and sexual aberrants. Um, finally, the, the middle section is, is sort of the meat of our discovery. This is, um, this is at this point only partially deciphered. There's, there's, a, there's a possibility that we'll never finish translating this section just because of the high, sort of highly abbreviated nature. But from what we have, we know that this is, the, this, is a, this is a draft of an unpublished theological essay by Williams. Um, so let me emphasize, whereas the first and third sections consist of Roger Williams' notes on pre-existing, pre-published texts, the middle section constitutes original, unpublished, never-before-seen commentary on issues such as infant baptism and the conversion of Indians. Um, these notes are presented as Roger Williams' contribution to a much larger theological debate. So the story goes something like this. In 1672, John Norcott, a um, fairly well-known Massachusetts minister and Anabaptist, published a book called Baptism Discovered Plainly and Faithfully According to the Word of God. In this book, he argues on scriptural grounds against the performance of infant baptisms. About seven years later, John Eliot, the man I mentioned just a few minutes ago, publishes a reply titled, A Brief, a Brief Answer to a Small Book, written by John Norcott against infant baptism. Um, in this book, he, um, he provides scriptural arguments to refute the points, the sort of claims made by John Norcott in the 1672 book. Um, at most four years later, Roger Williams crafts um, in shorthand, a reply to John Eliot's book, and titles it, very logically, A Brief Reply to a Small Book by John Eliot. Um, to, to the best of my knowledge, this appears nowhere else, and constitutes entirely the middle section of notes. Here's a particularly punchy passage from the preface of this essay. John Eliot felt Norcott's book to move him to write these few lines, but the words of the great King our Lord enjoin us to protect the gospel, whose written word refutes John Eliot, and whose word must prevail over the book of John Eliot. I hope a beam of light will appear to you by my labor. I shall not weary the reader with a large and onerous discourse. He does. I shall not let it so that the principles themselves prevail over the written word of God. Although the, the vast majority of the essay is focused on the topic of infant baptism, one paragraph in particular stands out. Um, in a short paragraph in the middle of the essay, Williams levels several arguments against Eliot's efforts to evangelize Indians. Eliot was known um, by Williams and his peers as the Apostle to the Indians. He famously established about a dozen different so-called praying Indian villages, which were these highly circumscribed communities designed by Eliot with the intention of encouraging Indians to reproduce good Christian lifestyles or whatever. Um, in this paragraph, Williams argues that Eliot's efforts are overall misguided and often involve treachery and seduction. Um, he also argues that, that missionaries such as Eliot often operated by manipulating Indians to, quote, do or say something as they were taught, end quote, without instilling genuine faith or knowledge. And in perhaps the most devastating critique of all, he compares Eliot's conversion efforts to French and Spanish 
efforts to convert Indians to Catholicism. Not, don't want to say too much more about the content of the essay just because our translation hasn't yet been published. But if any of you have specific questions about the content, feel free to ask me in Q&A or send me an email or something. Some natural, some natural questions that arise from all of this. When and where were these notes encoded? Well, as I mentioned, Eliot's book was published in 1679. Williams died four years later in 1683, which leaves a very limited window. Um, we can safely conclude that this reply to John Eliot was among Williams' final written works, and certainly his last major work of theology. Um, it's my belief, and this is just conjecture, that Williams did intend to ultimately publish these notes, but simply died before he was able to do so. Another question, is there any connection or correlation between um, the marginal notes and the printed text? Um, this is a pretty logical question, given that um, at certain points they have the same subject matter, both are sort of theological dispositions, um, or certainly in the middle section is. Um, but I think, you know, I think that's sort of just a coincidence. This is not a Dan Brown novel. Um, after all, Williams was a theologian, so it's no coincidence that he happened to have this theological book in your mind, and this happened to take notes on um, And there's, there's absolutely no evidence of a, of a direct correlation between um, the marginal notes and the printed text. Finally, why shorthand? This is a very good question, a question I get a lot. Um, I think it's tempting to assume that Williams was intending to conceal something sort of illicit by taking these notes in shorthand. Um, I think the more likely explanation is much less glamorous. Shorthand saves space and time, and paper was a very expensive commodity in 17th century America and certainly hard to access. This also explains why Williams took the notes in the margins of the book rather than on blank paper. So. <clears throat> I want to finish off today by walking you all through um, a sort of translation exercise. And for this, I've chosen a particularly, believe it or not, particularly legible passage from the first <laughs> section of notes. Um, which, I chose the first section of notes because, as you may remember, this section has a Rosetta stuff. It has a source text. So when we're done with the translation, we can compare our translation to the, um, to the original text and see what we get. So, I mean, technically, all the information you need is on the handout, but I'll, I'll give, because of all the defectives, you'll need a little bit of help. So the first two characters are actually, um, the first, they're, they're both special abbreviations. Um, <laughs> the first, you'll never guess, is the word from. Um, and I only know this from, from context, from looking at other examples. Um, this, is, this is the shorthand P, which you may remember is used often as a special abbreviation for the word the. So the first two words are from the. Now see if you can guess what the, the third word means. Just shout it out if you have it. Almost. Almost. I don't see a T though. I see a J and then I see an S. Juice. Juice. <laughs> Let me give you a hint. This is this is in the section of the of the cosmography on the sort of ethnic decomposition of Spain. From the Jews. First three words, from the Jews. This is this looks like the again, but in fact it's they. So so individual characters can double as can double for more than one small word or article. So from the Jews, they now what about this next word? Well, the first character is a B, right? Yeah. I don't expect you to get too much of this. The first character is B, and then we have an R, right? A horizontal line in what appears to be the O position. So B O R. Born almost. What's another way to sort of extend that? From the Jews, they. Or. Or. Borrow. Well, it is borrow. From the Jews, they borrow. <laughs> From the Jews, they borrow. The next word is tricky, but it's not impossible. So we start with the shorthand S, a long vertical line. 
This looks like a T. It's not a T. It's actually a P and an R attached. So it's a diagonal line with a sort of horizontal line at the base. So that's S U P E R, superstition. So from the Jews, they borrow superstition. His words, not mine. The Jews, they borrow superstition from the. Any guesses on this character? M? Yeah, M O R. Yeah, Moors. Yeah, we're talking about Spain. So from the Jews, they borrow super superstition from the Moors. Now this is really tricky. This I only got through context. Um, we have an M. We have what looks like kind of like a muddled L in the E position. M E L. And then we have some junk up here in the O position. It's M E L. It's melancholy. So from the Jews, they borrow superstition. From the Moors, melancholy. We have the same construction from the, again, right? Um, now, what's another ethnic group in Spain? It starts with a G, right? Goth. No, almost. Goths. From the Jews, they borrow superstition. From the Moors, melancholy. From the Goths, what do Goths have? Anyone know a Goth? <laughs> Gods have P R I D. Gods have pride. From the Jews, they borrow superstition. From the Moors, melancholy. From the Goths, pride. And and this is a um, a horizontal line, which is normally which is normally an R. In some instances, functions as the word and. And then we have the again. Um, and then this is really this is really tricky. This is. O, we have an L over here, and then a sort of D, it's old. And the old, now this we can get. So this has, this, <laughs> this is an S, yeah. right? Now we have a, attached to the bottom of the S is a sort of, uh, like a forward slash almost, right? Or the beginning of one. That is a P, right? And then over here in the A position, we have an N. So S P A N, talking about Spain, so good so far. And then <coughs> over in the O position, we have an R, right? Mm -hmm. Followed by a D. Spaniards? Spaniards, from the old Spaniards. From the Jews, they borrow superstition, from the Moors, melancholy, from the Goths, pride, and the old Spaniards. Now, we saw this defective previously. I use it as an example. Desire. The old Spaniards' desire of this we should get. Desire of what's the biggest character in this cluster? L. L. What's this thing? B in the in the what position? Liberty. Liberty. Exactly. So altogether, from the Jews they borrow superstition, from the Moors melancholy, from the Goths pride, and the old Spaniards a desire of liberty. And in fact, I'm not making it up. It's what he said. Um, and that's all. Um, yeah. I thought I could take some questions, though. Um, yeah. It strikes me uh, in, in reading some of the original language of Roger Williams that it was your job must have been made much more difficult because of his uh, rather odd spelling techniques and, and just the rather uh, archaic way in which he expressed himself. That, that had to be a further complication on top of all of this. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't just Williams, it was just the, no, way, sure. it was the way people wrote. There was no codified, there were no codified spelling rules until much later. But, this actually doesn't show up as a problem just because of how abbreviated the text is. So um, you're lucky if you get like two or three words per sentence. Sometimes we'll reduce an entire sentence to a word, to one sort of crucial word. And this was not atypical of 17th century shorthands. Um, the goal, after all, was to conserve space and time. And so given that he wasn't intending for anyone else to read this, there was really no, no need in his mind to elaborate much. Yeah. Did you go through each word the way you just showed us, or did you use some sort of computational algorithm? Or well, yeah. So I was lucky with the first and third sections because 
because I did have this source text. So I did, I did about a page like that, like very painstaking, and enough to sort of go on Google and fire, go in some kind of like database and identify a source text. And once I had a source text, um, I could use that kind of as a Rosetta Stone and go through line by line and compile a dictionary of sorts. Um, with the middle section, I wasn't lucky because there is no source text. This is original work, um, which is why it's it's you know it's taken so long. It's been like eight months now, and we're still not done. We've done like 15 pages of it. Um, yeah. There was a yeah. So that last section you showed up in the pipe was actually from either the first or the third section. From the first section, yeah. Okay, because that you had the two. Yeah, so the, the source text for the first section, which is the longest section, 160 pages, is a, is a cosmography. A cosmography was a, was a kind of like general description of the world. Um, they don't really make them anymore, but basically like a combination of <laughs> historical and demographic and sociological information um, all in one kind of compact volume. Um, this was an interesting and notable cosmography, Peter Halen's cosmography, because it contained the first um, known description of Australia, um, and also extensive sections on terra incognita, unknown land, um, hell, fairyland, all kinds of weird things. Yeah. I have a hunch that Williams chose this cosmography because he went to Cambridge with its author, Peter Hill. But I'm not able to find exact, I'm not able to, to determine exactly when Peter Hill was at, was at Cambridge, but I know he was at some point. Yeah. Can you walk us through? These were uh, unable to be deciphered for hundreds of years, you said, right? Um, can you walk us through how you figured it? I mean, and yeah. what people did it figure out before? Yeah. yeah, so I think. Um, I sort of got lucky. Um, a lot, a few people had tried in the past to decipher it, but um, the pure mathematicians didn't really have the patience because it wasn't hard math, and the historians didn't really have the statistical expertise. Um, and so I was in a sort of unique position, and I also had a lot of time. Um, <laughs> and I kind of just put a lot of time into it, and um, I used a combination. My first, my first instinct was to, to launch a series of statistical attacks. Um, a technique called frequency analysis, where you kind of you look at um, the relative frequencies of various characters and compare that to um, the data in English, right, to establish some kind of correspondence. Like the most commonly occurring characters in English are E, T, and A, respectively. So if you can if you can determine the most commonly occurring cipher character, it's not a bad guess to say that's an E, right? If you know it's a substitution cipher. Um, of course, given the given the way that the vowels work, that didn't work. Because vowels were, as you can imagine, vastly underrepresented. So once I figured that out, I had to sort of refine the analysis, sort of do vowels and consonants separately. And that gave me a foothold. That gave me a tentative key, which I then refined um, with, with the use of the Rosetta Stone from the first section. Um, and I, there's still tons of defectives I don't know, which is why the middle section is such a challenge. Yeah. Do you see uh, any future analysis of what you've translated changing our views of Roger Williams or changing our sort of knowledge of his views? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know if I'm really qualified to, to answer that. I think what he says in the middle section is not, doesn't represent a radical departure from what he said in the past, certainly in, in you know, Christenings Make Not Christians, this famous treatise he wrote on on some of the same things, on Indian conversions and so forth. Um, but it does clarify a lot of his views, especially vis-a-vis -vis, um, Eliot. Um, and, and this is one of the only you know, instances of Williams responding directly to Eliot. And there is this sort of, like I said, this fascinating connection, this relationship. There is evidence to suggest that Eliot was one of the people who voted to banish Williams from Massachusetts Bay. And so there was this kind of like ongoing animosity, and this was definitely, I think, a crystallization of that. Yeah. I mean, I'm a scholar of the 17th century, so you're exactly right with what yeah. you're saying. Um, 
that there is this animosity between Williams and Elliot, and they both have very different views to how they should convert the Native Americans and if they should impact. And you know, Williams has alluded to in the past that you know the praying towns where the Indians have to cut their hair and you know dress as Christians as Europeans. You know, he lives amongst the Indians here and he encourages them to you know continue with their lifestyle. So there's definitely that contrast there. And I think you know for me the really exciting thing is is how he's in, engaging with John Elliot. I think that we, really will have a really profound effect. Yeah. What I was going to ask you was, you know, um, you say that you're writing this uh, article with Lynn Fisher in the history department, and I was just wondering that, you know, following on from that, are you going to publish this once it's all decoded? I mean, is yeah. it going to be a separate book project? Well, so if you're interested in the first, like, if you're interested in the first and third sections, I can yeah. give you the names of the books, and <laughs> that's probably the best way to see them. The, the middle section, like I said, is not yet done. We will probably never finish it. It will probably never be finished because. Just because, I mean, the, the handwriting is abysmal. There are all these defectives. Um, entire sort of words and sentences are omitted, so it's very hard to sort of to piece it together into something coherent. Um, but we will eventually, once we publish this article, probably put all of the translations online um, for people to look at, and hopefully include some kind of interactive feature where people can kind of um, put their cursor over the code and see the corresponding plain text or something like that. So that scholars can kind of go go over it on their own. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I came in a, a few minutes late. The book was in a collection of the Browns. Mm -hmm. So there had been some question as to whether this might be Williams' book, might have been, or was that a certainty? That was. I mean, that was never a certainty. I even now, it's not. I wouldn't say 100% certain. Although, basically, the, the book was donated to the, to the Brown family by a woman named Widow Tweedy. No one knows who she was. Okay. Um, but the, the note, um, um, in this note, she conjectured that Roger Williams was the man responsible for the writing in the margins. I see. Um, but she provided no evidence for that, really. Okay. Um, so to confirm that hypothesis, we looked at other instances of William shorthand and his personal letters, which were signed by him, known to be his, and, and also in the Elliot Indian Bible, which we know was in his possession. So I'm wondering if there are other books that exist. Or no, I think it's this, just these three. Sure. I think it's just, in the essay towards the reconciling the differences among Christians, this one personal letter of his and then the Elliot Indian Bible, mm -hmm. to the best of my if, if I'm wrong, send me an email. I'd love to oh, it. I won't be looking, but I certainly <laughs> admire what you're doing. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. It, it absolutely yeah. is. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You said that um, because it's, it, a lot of this is phonetic, that it, it could be several different words, I mean, like butter, or something like that. Have you come across any where if you substitute one word versus another word? The meaning is has huge differences and, and kind of um, funny differences as to what nothing, it, nothing like that, but something kind of similar. We're working, I'm working with Professor Fisher on one line in this sort of, in this, in this paragraph in the middle section on Indian conversion. And there is one sentence in particular where um, if we include the word of, the meaning is, is radically different than if we don't. Um, so, so he's, he's sort of, he's sort of, in this one sentence, he's trying to insult Eliot by saying he um, he's sort of like a shepherd, and the Indians are like his sheep, um, and that it's not it's not a genuine conversion for that reason. But there are one there there are two possible interpretations. In one interpretation, he's saying Eliot is the shepherd of their chiefs. In other words, he's working directly with the chiefs and kind of coercing them to convert. The other interpretation is that he. Um, the chiefs are the shepherds, or something like that, um, and that sort of that places the blame on the chiefs, right? So, like, depending on how you, depending on where you put these, like, how you fill in these sentences, you get you do get radically different interpretations. Definitely. So, in this article, we're going to probably discuss both interpretations. Yeah, Victoria. Have like other personal letters that you wrote your hand and other um, first yeah, not not what he's written in shorthand because um, that's just as hard to decipher, right? But 
the but certainly looking at his, his other looking at his um, you know his bibliography like christenings make not Christians akin to the languages of America all of these sort of clarif give us information about his tone and his rhetoric um, his use of scripture which have you know that certainly helped us fill in some of the blanks yeah. Any last questions? Take maybe two more? Two more. Two more, okay. Yeah. Uh, you, modern shorthand is usually faster. Not, I, I guess it's space safe, but if I, if I look at my wife with a shorthand, yeah. it's, I mean, she can translate a newscaster. Yeah. But uh, do you guys use this? Or mm -hmm. have you found it to be a faster note hand, or is it just a space safe? I mean, I don't know. Texting is a kind of shorthand. <laughs> but but certainly like this kind of, I mean this is I can write in it but it takes me forever um, and so I think I think it, re it really requires like years of experience um, Roger Williams I clerked for Sir Edward Cook for like four or five four or five years or something and um, probably learned other shorthands too but but um, no I mean I I don't really find it that useful but I'm also you know I haven't used it very much. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, I was just wondering if your team now is using it for correspondence. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next? Is Brown going to retain you after graduation? Uh, this you, project? Lucas, you should say what's coming next for you. Yeah, no, I'm actually moving to Ireland in the fall. I got a fellowship to study um, mathematical physics at Trinity. So no more codes. And if, although... Yeah. Um, Maybe on the side, I got this. I'm working currently on this Scottish cipher that someone sent me. Um, this love letter, but maybe I'll have more to report later on. Yeah. But Lucas hopes to be researching and teaching. Is that your, your yeah. Thank you very much. Oh.